All right, good afternoon. Welcome to the Griffin Spalding County Board of Education work session 10-18-22 at 4 p.m. I'd like to call the meeting to the work session to order and if you would please place all electronic communication devices on silent or vibrate. And next we have the adoption of the agenda. Madam Chair, I move that we um, adopt the agenda as presented. So moved. All right, we have a motion. We have a second. All in favor, please raise your right hand. We're voting over here. Uh, Ms. Cook needs another microphone, please. Oh, oh you don't need a microphone? <laughs> I just talked to him. Uh, let the record show that Mr. Holmes is ill and will not be present today. I just talked to him on the phone. All right, so we have the adoption of the agenda at, at 4 0. Next is the consent agenda items. We have a motion. Madam Chair, I make a motion that we accept the consent agenda. Second. All right, we have a motion and a second. All in favor, please raise your right hand. We have 4-0, thank you. And next we have presentations and discussion, and first up is, is Dr. Sauce, policy JBA. Madam Chair, I was raising my hand to be recognized. Oh, I'm sorry. I thought, yes. I'm, go I'm ahead. trying to do what's right. Yes, sir. All right. I appreciate you. Thank you, Dr. Sauce. Yes, sir. Line 33 of the policy, it says the Griffin Spalding is under line 32, Student Attendance Protocol Committee. Griffin Spalding Board of Education will participate in and support the Attendance Task Force. Who are these members? And when it says the Board of Education, it's actually the Board of Education or the school system? The school system. Uh, so on the, as far as the school system is concerned, um, and the Dr. Moore is here, I may let her fill in in case I miss somebody, but Dr. Moore as Director of Student Services uh, is a member of that committee. Our social workers are members of that committee. Our truancy officer are members of that committee, uh, along with uh, other external agencies that we partner with um, th that we hold monthly, monthly attendance task force so meetings. So just for the clear purposes mm -hmm. in reading, instead of saying the Griffin Spalding Board of Education, can we say the Griffin Spalding County School System? Yes, sir. We'll Duly participate noted. in, and so just strike. Board of Education and put schools, Driffin Spalding County School System. Yes, sir. That's a, that's a good point. Yes, we will. All right. And the other question, Madam Chair, if I'm recognized, was going to be to line, okay, I see it in line. It, what, that's just for kindergarten. It actually states the OCGA. Which, uh, I'm sorry, which line, Mr. Brown? I'm sorry, uh, line 29. Yep, okay, got it. So why is the OCGA not listed for secondary or elementary school in the in the policy. Uh, it, it could be. That's a good. That's right. a good catch. So I guess you yep. can add in lines. I'm not going to tell you what lines, but just make sure the OCGA is in elementary and in secondary. Got it. All right. Yeah. Thank you so much. Yep. Any other questions about this policy? Okay. 
Okay, in that case, I will move on to our next policy for first reading. Uh, the district is presenting the revision of policy JGJA, suicide prevention for first reading. Uh, board policy JGJA, excuse me, suicide prevention, is not recommended for revision at this time. Regulation JGJAR1, suicide prevention, will be adopted, newly adopted, in order for regu regulatory language to articulate the methods of policy implementation. The district will post policy JGJA into assembly to receive input from board members and stakeholders for 30 days. The policy will be brought to the next business meeting for second reading and for final board adoption. Any questions or assistance I could offer or entertain about that policy? I think we're good. Okay. Thank you so much. Thank you, Appreciate Dr. it. Sauce. Yes, ma'am. Right. Dr. Taylor, policy JRB. Dr. Taylor. <clears throat> Good afternoon, Madam Chairwoman, Board of Education, and Superintendent Simmons. Um, I am here this afternoon um, to recommend the adoption of Board Policy JRB, which is the Parent Bill of Rights for First Reading. Um, just to give a couple of highlights to this bill, this is in response to, to the passing of House Bill 1178 that outlines for us um, the promotion of parental involvement in public schools. And so there are a couple of um, provisions here. First is the procedures for parents to review records of their minor child. Number two is the provision um, for procedures for a parent to learn about his minor child's course of study. Um, next, we have procedures for a parent to object to instructional materials um, that are intended to be used with their minor, minor child. Um, number three is procedures for a parent to withdraw his or her minor child from the school's prescribed course of sex education. And then finally, number four, procedures for a parent to provide written notice that photographs or video or voice recordings um, are not prohibited for his or her child. And so we have already adopted policy IFAA that outlines the difference in um, core instructional materials and supplemental instructional materials and so this policy really um, is to be in compliance with House Bill 1178. We also have procedures already in place where um, parents are notified of the course of study by way of a syllabus um, for courses and we currently offer the opportunity for parents to opt out of um, sex education um, and the, they can refrain from having their kids um, being photographed or record it. And so this policy um, at this time, we want to post it on first read for 30 days for our stakeholders to review. Are there any questions at this time? All right. uh, Mr. Brown? Thank you so much, Dr. Taylor. Mm -hmm. um, since House Bill 1178 was just uh, signed and put into office, how many, I guess, concerns have you received from parents as it relates to instructional materials in our district? Um, this year, just one formal complaint. Just one formal complaint. Right. And what was that process? Um, that process, um, really, um, some of the pieces of this bill did not apply to that. And so if you'll notice here that we are proposing a policy and we have taken some of the regulatory language and we are offering that up as a regulation. And um, that pretty much goes back to the principal. And so the principal does hear the complaint of that minor child and follows, follows these steps. There are five steps here that we have written um, in, in the event of a, of a complaint. But it goes back to the principal. Um, if the um, parent is not satisfied at that point, we do get involved here at the district office. And in this particular instance that I'm referring to, um, Dr. Sauce's office and my office reviewed that complaint and um, at that time um, we offered um, a review of some instructional materials. I'll point out also that this bill specifically talks about the review of materials within the first two weeks of school mm -hmm. and so it is very specific. Although it talks about the first two weeks of school, I am of the belief that if a scholar 
in our school system, whether they are in kindergarten or through 12th grade, if they are objecting to any material, then I want it to be known that there is a process. Sure. And that although it says the parents' bill of rights, that mm -hmm. scholars are able to fall under this. Mm -hmm. And if, if a scholar will be given that same due process and, and following those steps. And so um, thank you so much for that. Yeah, I would agree with that as well. Dr. Taylor, I just, right. I'm on page two, line 22. Okay. D, review period means the first two weeks of each nine week grading period. Okay. So based on what you just said, a parent only has two weeks at the beginning of each nine week grading period, or is it just the first two weeks of school? The, the first two weeks of the grading period. And so what, we, what that specifies is that we know that high school is on a block. And so that, sec, that two week period would start over right. in January for those high school students. Okay, good. That, that's good. Maybe I just misunderstood what you said earlier. Thank okay. You. And there's no, uh, one more question, Madam Chair, if I may yield yes, to sir. Dr. Taylor. There's no committee for this one, is it? In those five steps, I did not see one. No, it's, it's not required um, that there be a committee. Um, however, um, I do point us back to policy IFAA about instruction materials. That is where a committee um, would, right. would come into play. And um, you'll hear when Dr. Greer gets up in a moment to talk about um, the instructional uh, resources review um, process that we're about yeah, to embark upon, yeah. a committee would come into place in that instance. Okay. All right. Thank you so much. All right. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Taylor. Ms. Battle, policy GBRIG. Good afternoon, Madam Chair, Board Members, and Superintendent Simmons. I present to, to you Policy GBRIG, Federal Family and Medical Leave Policy, for first read. There are no current recommendations for this policy at this time. We recently had a policy review last uh, spring that we added uh, paid parental leave. So you can look at the policy. We make no recommendations at this time. This policy will sit um, on the board on the on the board assembly platform for members and stakeholders for 30 days, and we will bring the policy back for adoption at the next business meeting. What questions do you have for me? All right, no questions. I think we're good, Ms. Battle. Thank you. Thank you, ma'am. All right, Dr. Warren, policy IHC. Good afternoon, board members. I want to present to you for first read um, policy IHC, which deals with class rankings. And um, at the review of the policy, a couple of changes are recommended. Um, the first change, first of all, these changes would start with this year's freshman students, class of 2026. Okay? Um, one change relates to tenure of the students. Um, it's going to require students be enrolled in the Griffin Spalding schools for at least the second semester of the sophomore year, first and second semester of junior year, and first semester of senior year. So it's going to require um, tenure in that school district. Secondly, students to graduate outside of their four-year cohorts as determined by their year entry in ninth grade will not be considered for valedictorian nor salutatorian. So if you graduate early, you will not be uh, in the running for the South. And lastly, the determination of a valid and sale would take place at the end of the first semester of their senior year. That's more aligned with other districts where we're not cutting it close at the end, and those students can be celebrated during the entire spring semester. So they'll be determined at the end of the first semester of their senior year. So next steps involve the policy being placed on our similar website for input and review. And after 30 days, bringing back uh, the policy for a second reading. All right. Dr. Warren, I just have a quick question. I know um, in the graduations I've been honored to attend here. How is this information given to, because it, I, I'm just thinking the, the videotapes in my head of, of the valedictorians I've heard and the salutatorians that you know, in third grade, I had this goal to stand here this day. How, how do we be sure that our students are aware of these, 
this particular policy? Uh, it's, it's referenced in our high school advisement guide that they are encountered in eighth grade and freshman year and throughout high school as well. For this particular policy, it will be shared um, at the final approval in the second reading with this year's freshman class students as well as parents. So they will understand the new rules of the game before any official grades are assigned. Thank you. Yes, ma'am. Yes, sir, Mr. Brown. Yeah, all right, and my question, Dr. Warren, is um, although it's starting with the class of 2026, and Madam Chair asked, the, my question is, are you able to do this like during freshman orientation uh, where you can have someone that can, maybe the counselor or somebody from the district mm -hmm. office can go and speak to uh, the class rankings? Yes, sir, we're okay. able to do that. It, right. it's, it's very competitive in the kids. Um, they start in middle school trying to figure out what classes to take, the honors classes in middle school, and they continue that through um, honors and AP in high school to be competitive. So, yes, sir. Okay. We, they're aware of it, and we will continue to um, communicate the expectation and requirement to those students. And so the next question is, being that this is on first reading, it will be for the next uh, 30 days. After this policy is passed by this board, what will be the steps taken to make them aware of this policy that's just been enacted? As the high schools have um, class meetings with our freshman class, it will be communicated. For instance, it can be communicated in an instructional focus. Put the advice make out of the policy and, and show it to our students to be sure that they understand the rules of the game. All right, so, so we will get the word out to students and parents alike. All right, so we're going to hold you to making sure that this, in over the next 30 days, that yes, this is going to happen and students, scholars will be aware of it. After it's approved. After, yeah, after, I mean, after yes, it's approved. Sir. So we'll um, this 30-day yes, period, after it's approved, it yes, will sir. be pushed out to our schools yes, sir. so that they are aware, because I know ser several students who, um, like Ms. McDonald said, J.C. Mm -hmm. Barnes will be a great example, who mm -hmm. said that when she attended Remington's graduation and was trying to figure out who was that person giving the speech. Mm -hmm. And so it's always good when we have students who uh, are forward thinkers and see themselves being mm -hmm. in, that, in their shoes of valedictorian and salutatorian. So right. I just want to make sure that our scholars are equipped with the right information. Yes, sir. Thank you so much. I have, I'm sorry. Sure. I have a couple of questions. One, first one being, and I couldn't quite verify what it is, currently, what is it? Someone can transfer in their senior year? Yes, sir. Mm -hmm. Okay. That's the current practice. They can transfer in a senior year. Um, this, the rest of the senior classmates may or may not know the student. Um, they, could be, they could be a student in, on paper of Griffin High, Spalding High, but they could be taking all their classes through dual enrollment. So they really could be a, a complete stranger to, to their senior classmates. So this um, puts some stipulations in place to avoid that. And we researched um, some of our surrounding counties, and they have some are somewhat similar um, requirements in place as well. I would be interested in knowing a little bit more that I'm struggling personally with a <clears throat> military family that has to move, mm -hmm. uh, moving into an area, uh, a student, you know, so what, whether it's a junior year or I think there should be some tenure. Um, I just know four years is a strict rule for someone that's coming to our community um, to not have any kind of variances within that. Um, so the child may not have wanted to move from Arizona to here uh, in their sophomore year uh, and wanted to pitch a fit and had the same dream that Ms. Barnes had, um, but then they're in a position to where they can't. Mm -hmm. So it seems a little strong to me uh, to be a full four years, so I just would like to know what more surrounding counties um, are doing with that aspect of it, and uh, my tendency would be to not go all the way the full distance if we can find some kind of compromise. Well, right now they can move in at any point. Um, it's only with the freshman class where we're saying that at least if they're here by the second semester of the sophomore year, moving forward, they will be eligible. So it's not their entire four or four years. Okay. So it gives them, um, they can miss a year and a half. They can miss freshman year and first semester, sophomore year. And, okay. And move in afterwards and they could be in the running. Okay. And then also what I think that we should do in, during this period, and I know this is probably something that we have not normally done before, but I would love to see what the class of 2026 thinks about this particular okay. uh, policy. So within that 30 day period, getting some feedback from those freshmen to see how they feel about this. Because at the end of the day, uh, what we do here is for our scholars. 
And yes, we have our own you know, opinions and how we should do things, but the, the forefront should be for our scholars. And so I would love to hear the scholar voice in this policy as I would love every policy, especially with this one that deals um, directly with them mm -hmm. and the people that they are in school with, their classmates. And so mm -hmm. just uh, superintendent, if you would, make sure that students who have a voice within this particular policy um, to provide feedback for class of 2026. And, and I, can, I can say we will take care of that. And anecdotally speaking to students for our block scheduling task force, this is one of the things that came up. Yeah. So and I I'll, think they will be in favor. We will research that further and get I, more of a broad I, voice. I know with last year and year before last, I had parents and students that are scholars that approached me as well. Mm -hmm. So it's good to see it. But what I just want to make sure is that the scholars that this will affect, it says 2026, that they have a voice and they are making sure that their voice is known and heard. Um, through this particular policy and in that window of getting feedback from stakeholders. They're our main stakeholders, so I think that yes, it's important for them to be able to Understood, them. understood. Thank you all. I would agree with Mr. Brown and Mr. Doss, and um, mm -hmm. I think all of you in this room know that I'm, I'm one to get feedback from the people that we represent. Mm -hmm. that's, mm -hmm. If they weren't here, we wouldn't be here. Mm -hmm. So that's great. All right, thank you. Thank you, Dr. Warren. All right, next we have a professional learning updates. Dr. Steele. Hi, good afternoon, Madam Chairperson, members of the school board, and Dr. Simmons. Um, I am here to provide an update on the professional learning for this current school year um, and some of the activities we have had planned and some of the feedback that we uh, have received already. Ms. Dr. Steele, if you could just speak into the microphone. Oh, yes, I apologize. Thank you. Thank you. Um, when you look at um, where we are professional learning, we are here to make sure that we're up, th that one of the objectives is to make sure that we're cultivating a high performing staff, which is part of our, our roadmap. One of the platforms that we use, our professional, our learning management system that we use is KickUp. Um, KickUp is used to manage all of our professional learning sessions. Um, staff are able to, um, st the staff is able to register for, uh, for sessions, um, receive copies of the transcripts, and other information as a part of KickUp. The number of classes that have been offered since July through KickUp, which are delivered virtually and in person, is over 400, and we are still adding sessions um, to the learning management system. Um, the overall feedback so far from the sessions that have been presented, uh, that have been shared already, 93% um, of the participants felt the PD highlighted effective practices. Over 91% of, of the participants felt the training received was moderately or highly effective. And an, over 92% of the participants perceived that their professional learning experiences will have a positive impact on their practice. Some of the next steps that we've determined from the data in KickUp is that to make sure that we have um, additional follow-up sessions, um, that make sure that it's not a one-stop shop, that they're um, providing ongoing support in schools and in uh, the departments for the training that has taken place. So for the professional learning dates, we have in the calendar there were scheduled five dates, and you have those uh, scheduled. Uh, you see those dates for those sessions. Um, one thing that we wanted to make sure to highlight is that of the five dates, there are two and a half days are provided for teachers for planning, for additional planning time, and the additional, the um, leftover one and a half days are used for professional learning. Um, the sessions that take place for professional learning are not just for instructional staff, but they're also for classified staff. And when we look at the needs of what is being scheduled or look at the information that's being um, shared in the sessions is not just, again, uh, for the teachers and staff, we're using that based on data, the student data and the assessment and their walkthrough um, data that is also managed through KickUp. Madam Chair, if I may interrupt just to ask this question. Um, Dr. Steele, is, is there any way within KickUp, those sessions, those PDs are recorded, right? No, well, it's not offered through the registration. KickUp only manages in, as far as who's registering and who completes the activities. It's not, um, we can record and house that in Google, in Google Drive. That okay. could be an option for those who miss it. But some of the sessions are offered multiple times. So it's, if they miss one, there's uh, usually another session that's being offered. And I see that on this particular slide where it talks about the dates, like September 23rd, November 4th, January 4th through 5th, and March 17th. Mm -hmm. My, so outside, kick up just 
stores that let you know who's registered, where you get this the data from. But what about if there are ongoing sessions that they're able to review, not necessarily that it's on a scheduled day, but then being able to go and not using KickUp, maybe you're using another system for that, mm -hmm. but going being able to go back and just, let's say if it's differentiation of instruction or there's videos, a TED talk on creating relationships. Mm -hmm. Where's this information stored for our educators, teachers to go and see this information? So if you're registered, let's just say for instance, if you're registered to take a session and the facilitator has extra resources, they will provide the information in KickUp to refer back to or they're also included in the Google Drive. So everything is stored for those participants who register for that session. So if you miss a session, how are you able to get that information? You would have to contact the facilitator. And like if they're not offering an additional session, they could just contact the facilitator and receive that information from them. So that information is still listed, so they'll know exactly who to contact. Is that house and kick up? It can be. If they, uh, when the, so like, for instance, um, when a uh, facilitator submits a request for, um, to be added to a kick-up session, they'll attach an agenda and other attachments in there. So that still, I can go back in there and under anybody's um, session, and I can click on the agenda and see what's being offered, what was uh, shared during that uh, session. Okay. And then, I, so the, the next piece becomes, if there is, let's say there's not a session that's listed in kick-up. Mm -hmm. But another teacher was talking, was talking with a coworker and said, hey, you missed this session, you may wanna, are they able to go and review that information from another system? From another system or? Either from... another, through KickUp or through another system? Because I just think that if, if, if we're doing these professional developments, they need to be recorded so that teachers can go back and look at them. Right. So just because I received this professional development this one day, and yes, I may have taken notes, but I want to go back and review because that's how you become better. That's right. how you improve your instructional practices uh, by looking at and, and taking more notes and seeing how you're actually delivering this instruction to your scholars. And so I just, is there a system that can, maybe this is not a kick up conversation. Mm -hmm. Maybe this is another conversation. Um, but I think if it's, it's definitely housed in HR as, it's, as a personnel resource. Right. I'm sure Mrs. Battle can speak to that, but I just feel that because um, I heard from a couple of teachers that said, well, we're unable to view this information again. So, or, so how can we house it in a place after, okay. how can we house it in a place after it has uh, been done on our end so that other teachers can see it, may not necessarily get the credit and kick up for registering, but at least it still is an additional resource that they can use to better their practices. Right, I see what you're saying. So, so if I may, I think, I just want to be clear, Mr. Brown, with what, what I think you're asking. You're wanting to know if we warehouse or archive professional learning sessions. In some cases we do, but those are probably going to be those that are virtual. Mm -hmm. Less engaging, but virtual. That's part of my push in speaking with instructional technology to make sure that classroom spaces as well as learning spaces are equipped with the instructional technology so that recording is, is, a, is a possibility. What you'll learn is that if those three gentlemen were unable to be here today, we would not be able to stream because of that bandwidth required. What the facilitator would have to be responsible for is having someone other than themselves man the camera and the such. Some of our classrooms are able to record, but that's gonna be the facilitator's discretion or wherewithal to remember to do that. Uh, we do have the capability of doing it. That's what Dr. Steele was talking about, warehousing, warehousing that on Google Drive. But I do think it's a good idea for us to find a way to enable those who may want a session to be able to go back and review it. Uh, we do, I believe, or we did at one point in the district have access to uh, taped or videotaped content. It may not be as up to date, but I think I understand if we don't have it, you're asking, can we move into Can we get it? Yes, sir. I got it. Appreciate you. Yes, sir. So we'll work on developing a system for um, making sure those resources are accessible. Thank you. Uh, all, right. all right. So I wanted to introduce some of the initiatives for the professional learning um, department for this school year. Um, the first one uh, that we hope to um, have in place um, beginning in January is a classified employees academy. I'll talk about each initiative um, in, the addition, in the other slides. 
So the training will uh, focus on those four areas that you see, compliance, job knowledge and technology skills, communication and interpersonal skills, and leadership and management skills. We are also continuing our uh, relationship with Griffin Risa to offer endorsement scholarships um, for each of the areas that are listed. These are free, uh, free um, courses that our staff members can take. Um, we are also um, introducing this year as well um, our GACE paraprofessional test prep workshops um, provide test prep training for to be able to take the assessment and assessment fees will be paid for up to two attempts for our employees, classified employees. We're also looking at not, a new hire onboarding and that will offer information um, for ongoing um, training sessions for our new employees as they are hired, um, say for instance every two weeks, um, so that we'll receive information before entering the workplace, um, they're going to the work site and so they'll have um, technology resources, anything that they need in order to be prepared when they enter the work site. So for the Classified Employees Academy, again, we talk about compliance training, job knowledge and technology skills, communication interpersonal skills, and leadership and management skills. So there will be sessions offered for our classified staff under each category to help them improve their um, work skills, specific job skills, um, skills for their job site and um, things that they're looking for to improve for our future um, career um, opportunities. And again, we talk about the Griffin Risa um, relationship, and you can see a list of all the endorsements that are available now. The teacher leader endorsement just opened up uh, for registration um, for staff members. And again, these are all free to, to take place. They have to um, have recommendation from their um, administrator in order to participate. Here, again, we're expanding on the GACE Paraprofessional Test Prep Workshop, and you'll see the goals, which is to receive, to uh, provide an overview of the GACE assessment, and give the participants an opportunity to practice test-taking skills in reading, writing, and problem-solving through practice questions. They'll also be able to create a study plan to prepare for the GACE assessment. So hopefully, even though we'll pay for two attempts, hopefully they'll pass that first time. And how to learn how to register for the GACE assessment, and once they pass, how can they make the transition from wherever they are as a teacher's aide or in another department to become a licensed paraprofessional in Griffin, Spalding and County Schools. And finally, one of our other new initiatives is new employee onboarding. And the purpose, again, is to assimilate new employees quickly in the district, learn about the district and its resources, and understand the district expectations. The sessions will be held every two weeks after the confirmation of the new employees, and representatives from each of the departments of human resources, finance, instructional technology, uh, information technology and teaching and learning will lead sessions on a rotating basis. Excuse me, that's supposed to be in, uh, information technology. And all certified and classified staffs are required to attend one day session prior to reporting to their work site. And that is the end of my presentation and I look forward to any questions you may have. Dr. Steele, um, this is, I don't know what the current practice is, but I, I, I really like what I see here and what I heard you uh, share with us are the is the classified employees academy is that is that live and in person no that that will be live and in person it um, will be live yes and in person? <laughs> yes okay. and so the goal is because they have certain different work hours then instructional staff will try to make opportunities for them to attend not so much spend so much time after school but also uh, before the last two hours of like every Wednesday that's great. That's good to see. And the new hire onboarding, is that something new we're doing? Or is that, have we just... That's going to start in November. That will start in November. Just re, we just have a new recipe for it. Yeah, it's, yes. it's, it's a new process. Okay. We've been onboarding employees, but not to the level, um, not to this level. Okay. Thank you so much. And that's, uh, that's pretty cool that all those endorsements through Griffin Risa are, are, are free. That's pretty awesome. I don't think that was the case when I was teaching. <laughs> That's Me awesome. neither. <laughs> Do what? Probably not. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Any other questions, board members? No, thank you. This makes me feel good. Okay, great. Thank you, Dr. Steele. All right, thank you. All right, Dr. Greer, um, teaching and learning updates. Good evening, Madam Chair, Board, and Superintendent Simmons. This afternoon, I will provide you with updates from the teaching and learning department. Of course, we have our non-negotiables, which are to be professional, be accountable, and communicate effectively, as well as our focus areas, our mission and vision, and our roadmap to success. 
where we observe three pillars, leadership, teaching, and learning with an ultimate goal of student achievement. Again, the purpose of today's presentation is to provide an update from the Department of Teaching and Learning. The presentation will include updates for very specific items, including the use of our Ready for Tier 2 and Tier 3 instruction, use of Kick Up for Learning Walks, New Georgia Bath Standards Implementation Plan, as well as the Instructional Resources and Materials Review and Adoption for K-12 ELA and K-12 Science. Georgia, the Georgia Department of Education provides a model for the MTSS framework. MTSS stands for Multi-Tiered System of Support. It is a prevention framework of evidence-based system-wide practices to support a rapid response to academic and behavioral needs. If you take a look at the pyramid, you see that we would like to see 80% of our students receiving and responding to Tier 1 instruction. And for those students who are not able to respond to that instruction, we will provide secondary and tertiary level prevention and intervention efforts. The Georgia Department of Education has also provided several components of MTSS that they'd like for us to follow, including screening, progress monitoring, database decision-making, multi-level prevention system, and infrastructure. As it stands for screening, we did administer the NWEA MAP assessments as our universal screener in August. We will administer it again in December and in May to students in grades K through 10. We use the MAP assessments to determine the students who could benefit from Tier 2 and Tier 3 instructional support using MAP. If you take a look at the graphic, you will see specific assessments that were offered to our students. For students in K-2, those students were able to complete the MAP Reading Fluency Assessment as well as MAP Growth for Math. In grades third through fifth, they completed MAP Reading Fluency as well and MAP Growth Reading and MAP Growth Math. And in grades six through 12th, or six through 10th um, actually, they completed MAP Growth Reading and MAP Growth Math, MAP Growth Math as well. The universal screening process is a process of assessing all students to identify individuals who are at risk or in need of ind more individualized support. A second component that we are responsible for is progress monitoring. That purpose is to determine the effectiveness of an intervention plan on student learning. For K-8, we use our ready for this purpose. Our ready is used to provide progress monitoring and direct instruction on student skills deficits these skill deficits were able to be determined by the MAP assessments. For high school, we use STAR 360 to provide progress monitoring and direct instruction on student skills deficits. As it relates to our ready, we have a snapshot of our progress to date. We have 685 K-8 math and reading teachers who have access to the our ready toolbox. This is a comprehensive toolbox that provides instructional resources for students. We also have over 1,200 students who have started the progress monitoring pathway. 98% of those students have started the progress monitoring pathway for reading, and 98% of those students have started the progress monitoring pathway for math. That 2% makes up those students who started the program late, and we are able to um, get through to 100% in the next few weeks for those students. Dr. Steele just mentioned about KickUp. We also use KickUp Foundations module. We adopted the KickUp Foundations module to provide coaching and feedback to classroom teachers, plus conduct learning walks to determine the progress of teaching and learning at all levels. To date, we have conducted six learning walks using the KickUp Foundations modules. And district school leaders have conducted over 1,300 classroom observations during first quarter. This data is being used to guide coaching conversations with classroom teachers and determine professional learning needs. This is a snapshot of what you will see in the Kickups Foundation module when you take a look at the data. We regularly assess pacing, use of the instructional framework, and use of specific instructional practices. As you can take a look at this one, you see that we were assessing pace across the district and when visiting over 1,200 classrooms, 96% of those classrooms had teachers that were on pace with instruction. This is just one graphic that can be pulled from Kick Up Foundations module along with many others. 
The next update is around the new Georgia Math Standards Implementation Plan. The Georgia Department of Education is slowly providing guidance on the release of Georgia's new math standards. There are some things that we know right now. One, we know that Georgia's new math standards will replace the Georgia Standards of Excellence for Math. We also know that the Georgia's new math standards will be implemented K-12 for the next school year. Lastly, Georgia's new math standards will not offer an accelerated learning option in middle school outside of Algebra 1 for 8th grade students. As we learn more information regarding the plan for the state of Georgia, we will be rolling it out. We have created an implementation plan for our district. This is being spearheaded by our math coordinator, Dr. Shannon Thompson, and below you will see some of the activities for this month, which simply allows me to present some key information to the board today. We're also working with our division as well as high school principals to make sure that they are aware of some of the changes that are coming down. And we're working with a math task force. That math task force includes representation from each of our schools, elementary, middle, and high, to review some of the changes that are taking place with the math standards. We will continue also this month to work with Griffin Risa as we roll out our plan. My final update is that for the Instructional Resources and Materials Review and Adoption for K-12 ELA and K-12 Science. Board Policy IFAA was adopted some time ago, as well as the Regulation IFAA R1 for Instruction Materials Selection and Adoption. This is providing us guidance on how the district will proceed with the review and adoption of instructional materials and resources. Using this guidance, the Department of Teaching and Learning will start the process for the review for K-12 ELA and K-12 science. The next few slides do highlight some of the events that are taking place each month as it relates to reviewing and possibly adopting materials. There are several departments represented outside of the Department of Teaching and Learning. We also, again, have task force members for ELA as well as science to participate. We have opportunities for parents, for teachers, and community members to also offer input in this process. At this time, I will entertain any questions you all may have. Any questions or comments, board members? That's a, that's a lot in a small amount of time. Thank you. Thank that's you. Awesome. Thank you, Dr. Greer. All right, next we have the infamous Mr. Bruce Ballard. Mr. Ballard, good afternoon. Wow. <laughs> good afternoon, Madam Chair, board members, and Dr. Simmons. Appreciate the opportunity to come out today and um, present you with another splashed update. We've been trying to do this the last several years, uh, twice a year, uh, March and October. So get this one done, kind of give you an update of where we, where we stand currently. Um, as is always, our non-negotiables and focus areas are, are very important and results pyramid and definitely in the maintenance and construction department, we try to work with the see it on it, solve it, do it um, attitude and trying to get things done, keep things rolling and keep things moving along as smooth as they can. Um, our mission and vision are a key component of our efforts, as well as our roadmap to success. Um, the aspects of the splash update really ties in with the um, organizational operational efficiencies and those efforts. But again, each uh, component ties into other components of our objectives and priorities within the, the roadmap to success. Um, with that, um, moving into the Splash 3 update here. Um, as noted before, the items that are, are highlighted um, have been completed. Those are, are pretty much done and, um, and are set in, in, in place now for the last, um, since our last time. We still are doing additional efforts and carrying on additional efforts at Griffin High Memorial Stadium and of course here on this campus as part of the Splash 3 program. Um, with that, we currently have a total remaining as of the end of August when this was, was ran, um, 
$3,373,152. Um, Memorial Stadium, of course, we've been working on it, have recently um, added some security cameras down there and we'll continue to, to work on that. We're actually also installing a wireless bridge that will allow us to be able to add some more um, cameras and have some more capabilities down there. Um, we also are, are still looking at some storage and um, ticket booth uh, needs. What we, we did over the past week um, also um, were able to uh, receive and we're, we're trained on the um, metal detectors for the system. And we will be housing a couple of those at the stadium. Um, one of the things we're looking at, because of the size of them, we, we actually are having to go in and um, set up a different storage area on either side that will accommodate those. And um, so we're working at, at that. And one of the, the latest storage um, booth that we put in, that our um, ticket booth we put in that hasn't been, been used, we've been trying to kind of sort out what best to do with that because we no longer are selling hard tickets. Um, what we're looking at now is using that to house the, uh, the metal detector and a potential of a, of a future one there on the home side where it'll be very convenient to, to move in and out and plus we have to keep them charged up and so forth. So, so that will work well in that particular area. Um, so we're looking at that. Um, Griffin High School, we have had the engineer had prepared a concept plan for a much needed um, athletics parking lot and parking area around that athletic facility. Uh, he has submitted that to us. We've reviewed it and have had some comments on it that were passed back to him um, to go in and, and reconsider a few things, but that is well underway. And with that, we kind of had earmarked for the remaining um, projects at Memorial Stadium in Griffin High. Um, roughly um, 1.1 million is shown there. And with that, that would leave us um, from the splash three uh, $2,273,152 um, for the, this campus and other work we're doing around here for renovations and improvements. <clears throat> Moving on down to SPLOSH 4, um, again, we're still doing some work at Axon, Cowan, and Jackson. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, Axon Elementary, we have, we talked about here a few months ago, a track. We're looking at putting in a track over there. The track has been installed now. <clears throat> We're still working on some benches and other activities around the track. Um, so that's in the, still in progress, but moving along well. Um, at Jackson Road, we still have some utility monitoring systems that tie into our control system that are yet to be installed. We've been, we're hoping that was going to be done over the October break, but the contractor was not able to get that done. So now we're shooting to do that over the um, Thanksgiving break because that needs to be done when school is out for um, several days. Um, so that's what we're shooting on there. So with that, <clears throat> from Splash 4, that would leave us roughly about $817,671 um, for work uh, around this campus also. Now with that, we'll kind of look at the summary of what we have for this campus. As you all know, um, we've been continuing to look over the last couple of years to <coughs> excuse me, do some improvements, work on things around central office. Uh, most recently that the project has been um, renovating the C building for finance and HR. Um, we have them there and operating out of there now. We still have a few items to complete um, down there, but for the most part it's operational. Um, we desperately need to get a roof on this building. Um, and we have uh, some server room needs that came about in our past audit. Um, an ancillary system to handle um, if we had a, a, a fire issue, a, a kind of a suppression system. Um, if we had a fire, um, some additional HVAC needs and um, a generator backup, which has become more and more important. We do have a battery backup system here. Um, at, when it was put in, it would roughly give us about four hours of backup. Um, but again, you know, everything now basically runs through those servers. That's the heart of the system in so many ways. And so really at the need of, of getting that generator put in there to give us extended periods of time if needed um, for a power outage. <clears throat> in addition, we still have a parking lot upgrades and improvements around here. And then we're also looking at um, kind of a new face, new entrance way here for um, for the central office campus. Um, as we talked about before, 
additional parking out in front of the building, parking out in the courtyard here adjacent to this building. We're kind of looking at making the, um, out here off the courtyard parking to become the new entrance way into central office, um, right here close to the boardroom and kind of build upon that. Um, we have a concept plan put into place. We reviewed that with Dr. Simmons and feel that it's a good plan, some good opportunities there. But the key is right now, again, just looking at with the amount of money we have remaining there, just being able to accomplish that, what we, what we can accomplish. We are looking at, similar to like we've done in the, uh, for HR and finance in that building, uh, we pretty much subcontracted that work out and did it um, within our own maintenance department and let some of our crews do a lot of work. In doing so, we are able to keep the costs down and really get more bang for our buck. But on the other hand, it also stretches our, our folks and, and we have to watch and make sure we can still keep up the schools and do what we need to do there. So we'll continue to look at those options um, as we move forward here, some possibilities to um, really keep do what we can to keep the cost down and accomplish as much as we can. But the fact of the matter is right now with the uh, escalations that we've seen in cost and with, with what's going on out there, um, unfortunately there, there's no way we could just hire a general contractor to come in here and accomplish what we have in mind, what we'd like to see done on this campus for a little over $3 million. So we're going to have to continue to work through that, um, look at look at the, and do the best we can to prioritize and move forward in the best way we can in that as we move forward here. All right, moving on to splash five. <clears throat> Again, th this particular splash was one that we were very fortunate on um, as opposed to many of the others and came in uh, ahead of what our initial projections were um, as far as the cost went. Um, as you can see, we originally set out looking at roughly 44, a little over $44 million worth of work in our budgeted um, revenue there. And we've already expended over 45 and a half million. And we still have close to four and a half million left. Um, so we are still are working on and making additional improvements um, over and above what we originally had, had set out to do at these other schools um, because the way the splash was set up, um, we can, as long as it's within the guidelines of what, the, what was laid out in the referendum, and for these particular projects that were included in the referendum, we can still make improvements and do things that are needed there. So we're continuing to work along those and do that um, and make those improvements. One of the things with, um, you know, right now we're working on, we talked about here um, fairly recently, um, like the improvements at Crescent with the playground, um, and, and working on that, that is scheduled to, to be done the first of next year, plan to get started probably around Christmas, doing some of the grading work there. And then the, um, the contractor is supposed to be bringing in the playground equipment the second week of January to get that installed and, and get that in. Um, we'd also put some railing around some of the ramps and stuff, handicap, handicap ramps, and that has been taken care of now and done over there. Um, continuing to, uh, to do some of the efforts and, and improvements um, still at AZ Kelsey. Um, have real need out there. We still had the windows for that, um, for the gym, weren't replaced during the initial um, construction. And that's one of the things that's out there that um, we feel would really be a, a benefit. And we have had some issues with those windows not closing properly and um, setting up there. And then, of course, um, continued needs over at GRCCA um, with, with, on several avenues, but definitely some um, additional Im improvements and potential for the flight maintenance program. We've talked about several times in the past um, a taxiway. Um, currently, um, Guy the, that's, um, does the instructor over there, he, he's amazing at what he can do with planes, and putting them together, operating them and stuff. Um, and so, so he still, he gets down there and they actually taxi those pl planes around out there on the old ball field and um, along the old track area out there. But, um, but really for proper use and allow those students to navigate and do more like they need to do, uh, we really need that transition ramp down to that level and a proper um, taxiway out there for them. So we're, we're working on some preliminary um, designs on that and things to look at with that one, but we'll still continue to, to work on those with the additional funds we have. And then splice six, 
um, that we're currently working under. Um, again, as um, Mr. Jones has mentioned several times, as, as he comes up, you know, we've been very fortunate with the, with the splash revenue so far. Um, and with that, we're actually um, ahead of, of where we originally were, were looking, not only money-wise, but also progress-wise. Um, so just looking down the budgeted column there to the budgeted revenue, um, what was out there with the splash, the, rev the actual referendum was set up to provide $46,900,000 um, or a maximum of $50 million to be brought in. So at whichever, at the end of the project, if we hit the $50 million mark, then that would, would conclude the splash six um, money that we would get. And with that, right now, um, as of August, and you'll see um, in the next presentation that the September numbers are in, I didn't have them at the time, but we were actually now at 26, eight or so million. And, and with that, we're, we're tracking almost, you know, to where we should actually hit that $50 million mark if we continue like we're doing now at about four years or just after four years. So that's a really good position to be in the strongest um, position we've ever had with our splash. Um, but again, um, as I mentioned, we're also moving projects along because of that a little quicker as well. So if you look under the actual um, revenues and um, there, uh, or expenditures we have, excuse me, um, we're at you know, roughly 15.3 or 14.3 million on our expenditures. And if you'd have gone back and even figured it at the amount of money that it would take you know, per month to hit the $50,000 mark, um, right now, that would have given us about 10.6 million, I think, and um, we've we're already have spent 14.3. So again, we're trying to to move things ahead, keep tracking ahead, and part of that is because once that we hit that mark with the 50 million, and it comes to a close, you know, if we get to that point, we can look at the possibility of going out for another referendum if the need is there, and we can justify that. Um, Another thing that's important with that, so we want to show that we're, we're spending, we're moving forward as well as we can on that. But in addition to that point, um, we are, as I mentioned several months ago, we had, had brought before you and gotten your approval to move forward with the, a new uh, local facility plan, which is our five-year update that we have to do every five years. And so that is also underway. So we're going in with a good position. That, so by the end of this school year, we'll have a new facility plan showing our needs that are out there that will then come to, to you for approval and then go on to the state board for approval. And then we'll have, you know, the, be able to show where our expenditures are and then our a need thereafter. So we should be able to easily justify the need to continue that splash stone and maybe get in there a little bit early to keep that one cent going. So I think, Phil, that's very important as we move forward. So just um, a little more detail on those projects into Splice 6. Um, at Spalding High School, um, general contract, we currently are about 98% complete. Um, the majority of the work there that's remaining are some um, late change order work that we were um, had initiated, as well as um, the punch list and just finishing up the work. Um, in addition to that, we're doing some other work um, ourselves um, with interior painting, um, locker painting, and refurbishing um, the fields and um, irrigation. We, we've been working on painting and um, the field irrigation improvements um, over the last several weeks. Um, the shot clocks and the, um, the actual scoreboards are um, supposed to be here the latter part of this month. So all of that is moving forward and, and we're moving that forward um, through our efforts. Um, safety and security, as mentioned, the cameras at the stadium early, we're still also making additional um, safety improvements. Part of that um, also is uh, the metal detectors and getting that stuff in. And then we are installing the EPIC systems in all of our um, schools, and that's being coordinated through the IT department. Griffin Auditorium and the Taylor Street Gym, uh, that's about 94% complete overall as far as the general contract. Um, they're working now to finish up. Um, they, they have the roof on the gym, thank goodness. Um, and now they're working at just um, some of the fascia board trim and then they get the gutters on and get that finished up. Um, they finished up about 
three weeks ago now, um, the last of the lighting in the, in the auditorium as far as the, uh, the stage lighting. You remember that we were delayed on that because of components and you know couldn't get the materials in, but those are all here now and have been installed and we've already gone through a couple of shows with them, so operating well, um, so we're thankful for that. Um, currently, we're working uh, Cowan Road Middle School. Um, that's roughly about 32% complete with the, uh, the contract. Um, did a good bit of work over the summer, replaced uh, ceilings, uh, the, the lighting up there. Most of the LED lights have been changed out. Um, actually, over October break, we went in and uh, changed out all of the HVAC units on the sixth grade hall. Um, so again, progress is being made and, and we'll continue as we have the holiday periods and stuff th through this year, work on it still looks like we should be in good shape as long as we can get all the equipment in um, to finish up that project next summer. Um, Future Road Elementary is the project we're currently um, work working with the design on. We had our 50% design meeting uh, last week and uh, our tentatively scheduled that we should complete that design phase by the end of next month um, and we do so then we get that back make the reviews hopefully have that ready to um, put out to bid the right before Christmas or right after you know, early part of the new year um, so that's kind of in line with um, where we've been on the last couple and moving along pretty well with that um, because of our efforts and being able to move things along a little quicker, we're also going to go ahead and try to move that um, transportation facility design and, and get that underway um, when they finish up the future road design efforts and get that bid. Um, they are really struggling over there with that, um, that bus shop and some of the needs they have. And so we'd like to at least get that ready. And if the funds keep coming in, have it ready where we can get that, that out for bids. And as far as for schools, the next school renovation we have is uh, Moreland Road Elementary, which will be beginning right after the first of the year on the design of that as well. So still a lot um, going on out there in the construction side of things, but we are moving along well. Uh, I'd say really one of our biggest concern right now is just, you know, what can we do in the prioritization around this campus with what we have left there in that to, to make the most and, and get the most benefit um, out of what we put into this campus I think is is going to be a real challenge over the next couple of months and hopefully we can get that done and get that work finished up next year. Any questions? Uh, I have a couple of questions. Back Going back to SPLOS 3 and 4, uh -huh. um, so obviously there's a lot that we years ago had talked about doing that we definitely are not even able to consider doing. So there's still some things that we're wanting to do that we're not sure whether those funds are there. Can we get an updated presentation at some point in time soon, possibly, of what those plans are, how much funds are going to be needed in order to complete what we want to do versus the monies that we have to do so that we can, because I think one of the important things Somebody coming to our system, to enroll our system, sees this campus first. And we purposefully, over the years, have not done anything here, taking care of the, the schools first and the major needs. But it's now time that we finish this up, and I think we need, need to finish this up strong and finish it up well. And whether, you know, signage is going to be huge. Our, our people need to, in our community, need to know where to go for what. And uh, this campus is the hub of all of that. And so uh, I'm excited to see the new offices that we have over there and, the, you know, how we're working that. Uh, I would just like to know kind of what our thought process is going forward pretty quickly. Okay. I would agree with Mr. Doss. I, I, mean, I, I think most people in the room know that, that this needs to be completed. This needs to be done. Um, I was I was just going to ask what what will the new roof cost here? This the new roof for here. The, the rough estimate on that was I think around uh, 120 maybe 120 thousand. Wow! I thought you were getting ready to tell me 
three quarters of a million dollars or so. I'm hoping it won't be quite that so much. So for the whole complex? No, 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 no. That's just for this building. This building? Yeah. Okay, right. Okay. Yeah, this this building is, is our real need. Like I say, we, we had the bigger need was really the, the gym because of the problems down there, and it was actually affecting some of the wood. We actually had to replace a considerable amount of the wood structure in there. Um, but th- this building, other than that, is is the worst roof on the whole system. I, I disagree with Mr. Doss. This is the this is the first impression building. When people come to apply for work, when people come to apply to see people here that work here, it is the hub, and I think it's important that our hub look well. Mm-hmm. And I and I understand previous boards and previous administrations taking care of our buildings, but now it's time to take care of the building mm-hmm. that is representative of all of us. So I, I totally agree with what Mr. Doss just said. I I also just had a question, Bruce, just because. You know, we only talk about this twice a year, and I, I really appreciate you providing these reports for us. So, for example, on Splash 3, there's the remaining monies are $3.3 million. So once we finish these, what can be done with Splash 3 money that is left over once all of these other things that we told the public we were going to spend the money on? If there's money left over, where does that go from that splost? Well, this one, I don't think we're going to have to worry about any being left over. It's a matter of not having enough. Okay, so um, what happens if we don't have enough or we have money left over? So if you don't have enough, then you just, that's your limit. You get okay. there, and gotcha. you're either going to have to come up with money elsewhere from general fund right. um, or, or some other means, or that finishes up the projects you have there. As far as um, if you have more money, kind of like what we were talking about in Splash 5, then you can continue to do the type of work that you laid out in your referendum for those projects that were called out in your referendum. But you, you couldn't take the money there and put it, unfortunately, over here because um, Central Office Campus wasn't mentioned in, in there. I'm a firm believer that our transportation department needs to be, that that project needs to be started. Um, I mean, just how those gentlemen and ladies have to work over there just to maintain maintenance for our, our, our fleet, mm-hmm. that needs to be started. And I hope that we can start that earlier rather than later because it just needs to be done. It does. So, and I, I appreciate you answering my questions. Yes, ma'am. Any others? All right. Thank you, Mr. Ballard. Thank you. Good to see you. All right, Ms. Holder. All right. Good evening, Madam Chair, Board Members, and Superintendent. Uh, I have the honor of presenting the September financials tonight. So we're going to start out on page one. This is just an overview of our balance sheet. Currently, our uh, general fund fund equity is about $31.2 million, with our nutrition being about $1.8. Going over to page two, this is kind of an overview of our revenues and expenditures so far. Let's see. So our current month for September, we had revenues of $6.1 million and expenditures of $7.9 million. Continuing on to page three, again, you're still going to see some zeros on the top portion of this because we're still waiting on most of our DOE grants to be approved at this point. Continuing on to page four, this is the uh, statement of revenues and expenditures for school nutrition. Total revenues, $1.7 million. Total expenditures, $1.2 million, with a net revenue of 482000 so far. Page five. This is our current investments, kind of kind of like our cash balance at this point. We are at 27 million. And I think he did want me to point out the increase of the interest rate has gone up to 2.3. I know, I think the last time he mentioned it, it was around 1.5. So that's a good sign. And on our page six, 
SPLOS, the current month was 1.1 million, with a total collected of 27.7 million. Does anybody have any questions? Bruce, when did you say we would probably meet, meet our max for the current SPLOS in four years instead of five? Is that what you said? Okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah, because when I started, it was we were right at $750,000 a month, and now it's, it's always one. One 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 two one two. It's awesome. Questions, board members? Good. All right, thank you, Miss Holder. You did a thank great you. job. <laughs> thank you. I'll be sure and let Mr. Jones know. Our action item today is uh, the su superintendent's uh, new contract. We were thank you, Elizabeth, for providing the final hard copy for us today. And do I have a a motion to accept. Or so there, moved. So moved. A second. All right, we have a motion and accept the new uh, superintendent's contract. All in favor, please raise your right hand. All right, very good. You made it another year. But I'm still making more than you. <laughs> All right, thank you very much. Uh, board members, you have your uh, information items in your packet, monthly facilities and maintenance, construction, renovation, progress, and the employee basic life insurance and accidental death premiums. And we do have uh, items for executive session this evening, so to discuss. <coughs> To discuss or deliberate upon the employment of personnel and to discuss or deliberate upon the periodic evaluation or rating of the superintendent. Do I have a motion to go into executive session? So moved. I have a motion and a second. All in favor, please raise your right hand. Thank you very much. Four zero. Good to see everyone here today and uh, we appreciate everything you do for our system and our parents and our students and uh, we will see you uh, in a little while. We are adjourned to executive session. Thank you.